thank you to be here. So Fred, you are a type designer, I've heard. Uh, well, more or less. Uh, you have a micro. Ah, there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's what people say. Yeah. Okay, so you are a t type designer, a teacher, oh, yeah. researcher. What, what, do you, what kind of thing you research? History of letter forms and being able, the skills to make them. Okay, uh, a writer. You are the designer of the typeface Cadrat, Renard, yeah. Nobel, Arnhem, Fresco, Sansa, Custodia, Ludwig, Puncho, and few others, I'm sure. Yeah. <clears throat> you st studied at the School of Art of Arnhem. Uh, you work as typographic ad advisor of the Reproprographic Repro Company, OC, long time ago. Yes, very long uh, time ago. You are the founding member of the graphic design practice Cadrat, who is the name yeah. of your first typeface. Yes. Uh, you are designed bespoke typeface for on lettering for Philips Electronics. The people who shave probably know his work. <laughs> Canon Europe, the one you cop who do copy know your work and take photo to know your work. <laughs> Tom Tom, the one you try to find their, their way, know your typeface. Or Samsung, the people who watch TV or have fake iPhone. So he co-found co our type in 2002. <clears throat> His first book, Counterpunch, he was one of the best books I've read about typeface design ever. So thank you. It was published by Ethan Press and even translated in, into French recently. Uh, you, you get the uh, Gerrit Sarsday Prize in 2001. Wow, yes. congratulations yeah. for that. You are a research fellow for Planto Museum in Antwerp. Huh? Professor of type design at, wow, I'm not able to pronounce this word in German, a school for graphic and Bunchkunst in yeah. Leipzig. Buch, Buchkunst. Yeah, okay. I'm worse in German than, than English, so welcome in Paris. Yes. I can't wait to see welcome your presentation. Welcome to be back, yeah. <laughs> and uh, see you for questions at the end. Yeah. Thank you to be there. Merci okay. beaucoup. It's my pleasure, really. <laughs> Good evening, all. Thank you for coming. I think this is a nice event. It's uh, not too big, not too small, and it's in Paris, so I, uh, how can I decline a question like that? Huh? So, well, let's start. Uh, I've been here not that long ago, about half a year, three quarters of a year, and maybe some of the pictures you've seen already. But uh, first things first. Um, like Jean-Francois already announced, I'm a teacher. Uh, how that happened, I don't really know, but uh, somehow I have the habit of contemplating why we do things and how and wh why we do them like this. And that brings me to history. Um, writing somehow is important. Uh, here we see here just a, a, a German's uh, scheme of strokes for making a fracture M. At, um, at the beginning, and the first half of the 16th century, uh, made by um, Johann Neudorfer in Nuremberg. Um, what he is saying is basically this. If I have this, and I add that, and I add that, and I add that, and I add that, that equals M. Yeah? And if I'm able to make M, I can also write these ones. So there's a kind of recipe or a kind of structure, principle, in the Latin alphabet, no matter if it's a textura or an italic or even a Roman capital. So that's the value of writing. Um, the value of writing is not trying to be a callig calligrapher, in, uh, but in the first place, it's um, a nice method to understand how certain letter shapes are being built, constructed out of strokes, so to say. And then <coughs> you can things turn around and you suddenly have a bunch of other letters. So in our alphabet, things are, the letters are just made up of certain parts. And we can collect those parts. This is just a collection of some elements. And with that, we can, for instance, in this case it's stenciled, we have only this shape 
this shape and this shape, which are these two, and with those I can make four letters. It's, it's that easy. <laughs> yeah, really. And uh, if I have this, then I can make that, but in the end I can make this as well. So this is really a collection of just that. Well, it's, it's, it's a bit elaborate, it's a bit complicated, it can be even more simple, but with a few things you can make a lot. But with letters you have to make words, in the end that's the goal. And the word difficulty here had some difficulty. In the end, I like things very rough, deep in my heart. Um, you wouldn't say it, but uh, this is also stencil work from, from uh, the mid-80s, even before that. And I used to stencil there as a necessity, because it was just a means to play around with letter shapes you've made yourself. And uh, this is simply stenciled with a big, broad marker. And the stencils were made of cellophane. I have to say that nowadays I regret the fact that I didn't save more of this kind of material because this poster is just the only one of uh, dozens I made in, in those days. They are just thrown away. I mean, just... <laughs> and everything went okay until this man came flying around. Uh, he is Icarus and he came on a disc. He, and uh, you could put that disc in this small little cute thing and then together with that this logo came came about and it's a very important logo i keep on saying this 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 liberated western europe from fear <laughs> this liberated western europe from a too strong belief in stars like Hermann Zapf, for instance. Not that his work is bad, no, but there was suddenly a little bit more room, and this, this logo took care of that. Whether it remains so important nowadays, that remains to be seen, I don't know. Future will tell. But there, it was a platform for us to release homemade type. That's the right word, I guess. And the first one was quadrat, of course. And it's a very simple thing. It, I took a rather simple italic, which refers to the Italian writing books of the first half of the 16th century, and mixed that with my invented version of a Garamond-like typeface. Uh, back then, it was quite simple, because you just made a regular, a bold, an italic, and a bold italic, and that was the whole family. Only, I didn't like bold italic. I thought small capitals were more valuable. So, here they are. Capitals, lowercase, <coughs> and small capitals, even with small capital figures. And small capital voluta, strange ligatures. It was already there in 1992. This way became quickly a small but effective family. And it was recognized as such because in the 90s and even in the 2000s still people tend to use or like to use quadrant. One of the most funny uh, combinations is this, which somehow like the humor of it. And like I said, it was my early youth sin, so to say, of it was my interpretation of a Garamond or a French 16th century typeface. And I, I, I got that in this building, which is the Plantin Moretus Museum in Antwerp, which is actually the first printing museum of the, say, the Western civilization. And it's also, in the moment, the only printing museum which has a status of uh, world heritage. And there's a lot of French stuff in it. Look, yes. Le Bain. Yeah, This is what Chichold used for the sabon. Why he calls it sabon, I don't know, but he calls it sabon. It's not that, it's nothing to do. Yeah, I think so. And you made a nice 
updated version of it. But this is the winner, I think. Really, it's better than Garamond. <laughs> well, what? They were punch cutters. What do they make? They make cut punches, little bars of steel with letters on top. And this one, it's a really nice one. It's um, one of the best, at least, one of the, with the biggest output uh, ever, uh, the, the French punch cutter, Robert Grandjean. They were all born here, not that far away from this place, actually. It's a true italic. It's, it's perhaps the only real 16th century italic. It's one moving stroke. Ah, look, this is. I always say this is Arabic, but that's of course not true. It's, it's that G. It's, it's an interesting mistake to make, I think. It's a G which Matthew used for his Gaillard. So, this old stuff, quote, 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 old, um, is still around us. Actually, we can't get rid of it, and I'm helping <laughs> in it. I, I'm helping to, 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 to maintain it, to, to keep the image of it alive. That's not my real goal, of course, it's just the result of things. I'm a practitioner myself, that's so we see here. Um, the counterpunch of this little letter X. And I do that because I need to understand, also from a practical point of view, I need to understand what it is I'm looking at when I look at the art, uh, historical artifacts. And actually this, this is also maybe history of yesterday. These are smoke proofs. And they are made in Paris in 1992 at the Drupa. We had a small um, type lab here. Francois, you were there as well. And I gave there my first punch cutting demonstration. So my first, <laughs> you forgot all about this, didn't you? <laughs> no, but really, my first punch cutting demonstration was given here in Paris in 1992. And this is what I did. And these are smoke proofs of the process. Uh, what's a smoke proof? We quickly have a look. This is not a Christmas card. It's a punch that uh, catches soot, and then you print it on paper. And there we have a smoke proof. Wow. Yeah. So this is what you do. You, you start with a hole, which is made by the counter punch, and you take away everything you don't need. It's as simple as that. And I, I wrote most of my conclusions I wrote in this book, which was published in 1996. It was reprinted a few years ago. Then this year, yeah, this year, there was a nice, yeah, it must be this year, yeah? There was a nice French edition, and also followed by a Japanese edition. The Spanish are following behind, so there's a Spanish, or better said, a Brazilian edition coming up. The book is just in first general things, and then it fo can focus on uh, some uh, special work. This is, I think, the second most important punch cutter from, that, from those days, from those decades. It's Pierre Hautin. Um, and it tries to explain the consistency of his design, which he kept. We stick to it uh, faithfully throughout his whole life. Um, another sample is a punch like this. It's a rather big letter, seven millimeters. It's not French. Um, it's a Flemish punch cutter, Hendrik van der Keren. And I made a revival already years ago. Um, 1996, actually, it was released, I guess. Uh, I use it in the version of Counterpunch. The first Counterpunch is Renard. But so this is not, by exception, this is not French. Uh, it's Flemish. Yeah, so what do you do? A punch is used to make copies from. You copy it by hitting it into a piece of copper. Yeah. There's a scheme here, you see the way it's been done, quote, 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 but it gives, it gives a good idea. 
And you see clearly that the, the copper, the matrix, is a copy of the punch. And then you can put the copper in a casting mold and you simply press it at the bottom with a spring, turn it around and pour some liquid type metal into it and then you have a copy of the copy. Yeah? So here we are. We have the three stages, the punch, the copy of the punch, and the copy of the copy. Yeah? Because type is a copy of a copy. So this enables me to look at matrices, or I, I came to the idea in 2004, actually, to look at matrices. Because we have a lot of matrices, much more than punches. So it enables me to look at punches, which are lost, in a way. And that, you know, is, is interesting because there's so much to see. What I do is I put them underneath a microscope, and then I study, really, um, with big enlargement to see the details. For instance, this is done by an unknown cutter. It's a Hebrew character, and you see all kinds of bumps. And that means that the counter was dug out with help of gravers. This one is made by Lebe. It's very neat and precise, and it has these smooth edges. And that means that Lebe used a counterpunch for this. There's a big difference because you can say, so yeah, what's up? But for printing, this means look at this area. Yeah? This is the, the, the border between the actual outline and the counter is rather shallow and unclear. Also, the, 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 the outlines are rather unclear. So this will print, this will never print very accurate. But this will, much more. So this is simply done better. Another sample where you can see some mistakes in the end, which occur in the age again. Something like this, which comes back here again. So that's proof of a counterpunch used two times to make the punch for the N and make the punch for the H. This is work of Hotin, like I said. Somehow I have, um, I think the man is undervalued. So that's why we try to capture, capture his work again, to bring it back in today's atmosphere, in today's production, me production methods, in order to, hmm, not to get rid or forget about things which are actually quite good. So, and some day, somewhere in the beginning of the 2000s, we all started to sell our phones over the internet. And uh, my own little company was called Our Type, is called Our Type, and we had a kind of website which apparently was a big success in the beginning. Uh, we could all do all kinds of little tricks and that put us into the public eye, which was very helpful. And um, yeah, since I'm now sliding off a little bit to the finance side of this, um, I have a little remark to make and I, I hope you don't mind me doing it because, you know, I, like I said, I, I, I kept, keep busy with history. There's also a financial tag to that. Uh, I'm a type designer myself. That doesn't mean that I never buy fonts. The first font I ever bought was in 1987 because I was de uh, designing a book together with Wigger Bima, and we needed Baskerville Italic for Berthold's photo composition. That was one font, one negative, with 256 glyphs on it, and it costed us 4,300 guilders, about 2,000 euros. That's today, if you pay for a single font, 80 euros, you're buying something expensive. I, th I think half is more the general price. It contains at least 750 glyphs, 
Yeah? And you can use it on many devices or machines. So we talk about here a decrease in price of 96% and an increase in functionality, which is difficult to measure, but let's say 200%. Yeah? So are phones really expensive? Well, what do you want us to do more? Hmm? That's also something um, which you actually never think about unless it happens. <clears throat> there was a typeface Arnhem, which I released with our type. This is a picture of its uh, little specimen. We show letters big there. Arnhem was meant for the Dutch Staatskurant. And, um, but soon uh, people started to use also the typeface in all kinds of other publications like books by my uh, uh, publisher, Robin Kinross, did it. He even used it on his, uh, for his music um, uh, publishing house, the Bach Players. Um, of course, books, big books, impressive books like this, or books like this, so that's, that's all impressive work, worthwhile to see your work in, in such publications, uh, even religious publication. This is a state production by uh, uh, the Danish government, a very nice piece of work, I have to say, really. It's for a state production, this is really top notch. Um, typefaces don't have religion, because the same typeface is used in this book, uh, which is about something else. Um, of course, newspapers, Arnhem is being used in news, no, new, all kinds of newspapers, the, the one most known in the Netherlands is the third Dutch uh, newspaper, the Financiële Dagbad. But newspapers don't just publish newspapers, they also have online publications. So there is Arnhem on the screen. <clears throat> and, okay, for the weekend we need a nice glossy magazine to go along with, with the newspaper, else people get bored. Uh, so there is Arnhem in a, in a glossy magazine and <coughs> a designer once said to me that um, they are going to use Arnhem in an exhibition. I said, of course, yes, because it's good for captions. It uh, functions well in, in text. No, 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 he says, it's, it's part of the decoration. It's part of the whole exhibition. I couldn't really think what, what to think with it, it didn't, because I was so fixated of Arnhem text. So we, they sent me some pictures and they were so nice that I actually went to see the exhibition myself. Um, yeah, I mean, as a type designer, I don't mind huh? things, a use of my typeface in this, this kind of way. I, it's nice. But someday, I never got, I never thought I would ever got, got there. I mean, really. There's a lingerie brand, brand using it as a corporate typeface. And there, yeah, what? Really? <laughs> I always say. <laughs> Their campaigns are pleasantly <laughs> aggressive. <That's it. laughs> yeah. Well, but to be honest, I never thought. I don't mind, but I, it's not something that I expect of a real editorial typeface. People said it's a bit quiet around you lately. Uh, yeah, quiet around our type, but don't worry. We have so much things to do but we will be back at, uh, at, uh, at the end of the summer with Tasman, with Kufam, and some other things which I might show you a bit later. Um, yes, if you have to draw or design type all day, that I, I would be very unhappy. Uh, I won't recommend that, actually. Um, for me, the, like I said, there's so much around it. Uh, once we got to stenciling, stenciling is an old love for me, the, 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 the thing to do. And it's, it's, you know, 
early man had probably the same feeling because this is all stenciled. You know? Letters, of course, I like to stencil letters. This is an early sample, 12th century. It's a textura saying Ave Maria. Ave Maria, Ave Maria, Ave Maria. Um, lots of Aves Maria. The Neudorfer, he used stencil technique to duplicate his idea of the ideal Roman capital, capitals. So probably these stencils were used to make quickly samples for his students. There's only one uh, copy left in Vienna, but what we suspect since how it was done a bit roughly, it was just, you know, a method to circulate quickly. Then stenciling is very important. Like I said, punch cutting, the French are there in the 16th century. In the 17th century, the French are back again with stenciling. This is a manuscript of uh, Debillet. Debillet, Debillet. I don't know the, it's the real pronunciation, but he was a member of Commission Bignon, who was, in a, in a sense, responsible for the Romain du Roi. And he wrote, uh, a manual of how to make stencil letters, which was discovered by James Mosley and then given to Eric Kindle. And then Eric said, let's make uh, a reconstruction. The text should accompany these engravings. Now, the engravings were made, but in the end, they rejected the whole, the whole part, the whole chapter on, on stenciling. But, so now, finally, we have the two together, the text and the illustrations. And it's actually a manual of how to make French stencil letters, which are meant to make missiles or anti fanari books or pages like this. Uh, there are quite a few here in Paris. And some, yeah, usually they are very big, like this. This is all stenciled, except, of course, this. But the rest is all stencil work including the music. And that was the BA uh, writing about. So back to this, if we isolate the stencil letters, then we see that they look very different. They are plates with an edge, and then here there's a big hole and there are two part letters. Uh, we made a reconstruction. This is uh, actually a reconstructing plate, the Lumiere, the first part an orientation dot and a second part, and how it actually works, because the Lumiere is a kind of spacing system, how it actually works is shown in this little movie. Um, I'm going to stencil something with these kind of plates, and only you're going to look from the top. It, uh, don't worry, it's a very short movie. It's about, I guess, uh, slightly over a minute. But this is how it works. So the edge is used to, to give it support on a kind of ruler. And then you stencil along, you do the first part, and the, uh, the orientation dot. And then you move the second part above that dot. And the ridge is used to always have horizontal equal positions, let's say. And then you have your edge. Uh, yeah, it's, I, like I said, it's as simple as that. And, and then there's the Lumiere. You use that for spacing. Of course, you have to cover it again and then quickly <coughs> stencil the next letter. I uh, have to take a refill again, apparently. Yeah, there we go. And then up, we have a H and an I. Yeah? Quickly, the next letter, and here we see again the, the use of the Lumiere. The Lumieres are placed in such a way that you have to know what to do with uh, the serifs and what to do with rounds. You cover it and then blah, blah, blah. You do the first part of the letter, the orientation dot, and the second part. And that's... Tuck -a -tuck -a -tuck. Come on, come on, up. Then, and then, then we do the last letter, uh, which is, I think, oh yeah, the E. Here again, you see the, 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 what's the Lumiere meant for. 
it's not that precise, but precise enough. And then you do the E, the first part of the E, and the second part. So the double, double part letters are uh, take care for the fact that the stencils are stronger and that you don't have any breaks. Yeah? So it's, it's a French invention. Yeah? Don't forget about that. So it's, it's <laughs> no, no bass lines, acceptable spaced word images, stencil letters, but there are without breaks, so to say. If you want to know more about it, you can read something in this article over this issue of uh, typography papers. There's a nice article about it. But we have to go on and we go to Benjamin Franklin, who owns, who owned, because he's dead, of course, uh, uh, the oldest stencil letters we know. But they were made here in Paris on the Pont Neuf. I thought, uh, we'll, we'll see. Uh, here it says, in this little vignette, it says where he was, uh, Pont Notre Dame, sorry, behind the, the pomp in Paris. Franklin was a typographer, so he was interested in letters, and that's why he probably bought, out of curiosity, a whole box of stencil letters made by uh, Gabriel Berry in 1780. So, like I said, the oldest stencil letters for sure that we can date for, with, with certainty are French, uh, but they are not here. They are in the Newberry Library in Chicago. And it's very good work, probably made with help of etching. And uh, yeah, like uh, a Tuscan like this, it's a very delicate. You cannot cut that out with chisels or scissors, so this is done with acid. And <clears throat> a few years ago, two or three, when it, uh, 2012, I said to Eric, well, let's do something else. Let's make an exhibition instead of the next lecture or the next article. And we made a little exhibition in Catapult. Catapult, you know, uh, Jean-Francois. Uh, where is a little nice space in Antwerp at a, at a, a little design agency. Uh, we had there our uh, first exhibition on stencil letters. And that was, in, in, in a way, it was a premiere because stencil letters were exhibited more, but never the main topic of an exhibition. So, but this is then okay, the first time that that happened. And there's all kinds of artifacts to see, which we, we collected over the years. These are, oh, these are really older uh, French stencils. Um, where this comes from, I don't know, but this is even stenciled landscape for engineers who make uh, maps and all kinds of tools and vignettes to make stenciling very easy and effective. It's a completely forgotten discipline, but it was in the 19th century extremely yeah, every household had its own stencils. We made a little catalog, two language, in English and, and Dutch, uh, all kinds of different covers, because the designers of Catapult did it, so they play around. That's okay. And we had some big banners presenting our series of stencil letters. The stencil letters were all connected to some kind of technique or period in, in history. And yeah. And all together, it, it's a nice collection. And uh, they also are used now and then. If you take a look, then Spike Island, it is there on the lettering, but even in more modern campaigns like this, which it's an English campaign, this girl can, which tries to stimulate women to sport, even if the sports are so very male, so to say. There's a break. Okay, here I am, back in the 19th century. <laughs> <coughs> Delivering one of my signs to, to a, a client. Yeah. <laughs> it's an exhibition we did last year, 2014. Uh, the school in the, with the difficult name uh, in Leipzig uh, existed uh, for 250 years and it was my idea to 
to to you know to do something with uh, the money some 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 German bank, the Deutsche Bank, uh, actually sponsored to make a uh, exhibition in the museum of uh, Buchkunst, so book art printing museum in Leipzig, to make an exhibition on uh, big letters, not necessarily printed letters, but big. And the title was From Buch auf die Straße, from the book, so to say, into the street. And yeah, these are, so not only the French make letters on grids, um, it's also the Dutch did it, but that's another chapter. There are all kinds of, this is some impressions of, of, of uh, the things we collected. It's all coming mainly from uh, archives in, in uh, Leipzig, so for the first time, some very big institutions started to work together. And from, for example, in the city archives of the, the town itself, we found this sign, uh, which is typical 19th century, and you should not forget this is not wood. This is cloth. So, signs like this is like a canvas, really. And they were covered with kind of tar paint and then white. And that's there, that's also the reason why there's so much white on black. Because these signs are very light and durable enough for a couple of years. Yeah. Well, all kinds of lettering uh, books, of course. Uh, the, the juicy stuff is again French. Posters. Um, in this, we had the help of a private. Uh, collector who had a lot of fr uh, French posters and of course we had a journal published with it um, from Buch auf die Straße it's just a publication concerning about what happens in public lettering nowadays in Leipzig and there are some articles in it uh, German and English because German alone is a bit too 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 confined, I think, for such a publication. All kinds of samples which we thought were worldwide, worthwhile to see and to know. A lot of illustrations, many of them for the first time. And um, for instance, this. This is a special article by Pierre panet -Faure. Um He's interested in French poster and interested in early French posters and their makers. This is. Uh, uh, um, a rather well-known man, uh, Rouchon, I think his name was, or is, and he made a number of uh, kind of posters, a, no, uh, a number of them are still there, are still here in, 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 in a museum, and, but they are all different. They are handmade, semi-mass production, so to say, and what we are doing now, or what's Pierre doing now, so, so there's this famous photograph, and if you look here, and you enlarge it, then you see actually the poster there on that photograph. And so there are many more samples where we actually see the, the work of this man on, on historical photos in Paris. So that brings it all a bit near, more interesting. Ah, it must be crazy to do things like this, but of course it's, in it's, it, it's interesting. Wow. And that affects such an exhibition, affects or raises interest. And then people start to, to do things. For instance, they suddenly start to be interested more in display type or poster type, type for making a big impact. And this is one of the, uh, after the exhibition, one of my assistants said, oh, I have this, something like this, which is, he calls Cubertura, and it's something where, I said, okay, it's, it's nice. Or Prural Pro, which is something typical German, it's designed by uh, Thomas Diemich, uh, which, who likes to play around with all kinds of little, um, al alternatives, alternatives. And so typefaces with more than just one face, so to say, is a speciality. And of course, Club. Club is uh, a new product by um, uh, Jean uh, of uh, Pierre, Pierre panet -Faure. It's a very extreme thing as well. Uh, its first use is here on that cover. And um, yeah, 
just some impressions. But on the end, on the other hand, yesterday can be interesting as well, and this is something which was just not because of the project, the poster pro of uh, the, 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 the Leipzig exhibition, but simply just looking at uh, what, what's there of the uh, left, uh, of the foundry of the Gebruders Butter, which was a topic of one of my students. And there was this, of course, modular typeface. It's all hot metal type. It's just parts on a square. And you can turn around those squares. And yeah, so we looked at it and decided to make uh, a kind of digital variation. So it's not a font. It's, it's uh, a number of elements which you can type in and then with shift option keys turn around. And then you can you know, make your own words. It takes a, a little while, but it's, you know, it's, uh, you, it's just for the fun. And it's basically mimicking, um, how should I say, mimicking uh, hot metal, but then digitally. Um, yeah, traditionally I was always afraid of small sizes. How to make them look good, that's, that's traditionally the biggest challenge. But because of technology, and some, some new equipment, our typographic fonts are being used in sizes which really, you know, they are outside the scope of their intended use, so to say. And this is still rather hmm, decent, but you know, it becomes bigger and bigger just because there are printers who can print these kinds of, and suddenly we have our typeface very, very, very big. And that uh, makes me a little bit afraid. Why? I don't know. Because maybe it's a bit new. It, of course, it, it doesn't have a history, that's why. <laughs> but uh, it, it has not to be always like that. If, if you can really steer and define things, then you can make also big letterings like this, which is finally finished was finally finished last year. Uh, it's a design out of 2002. Uh, it's the, 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 the lettering of the bus terminal behind Amsterdam Central. So if you fly with a helicopter or a plane over it, you can read Amsterdam. Um, it's the biggest, they say, in Europe, lettering. I don't know whether that's true, but uh, the design is from 2002, it should be finished in 2009, and we had, and in the end, 2013 it was finished. So if you work for architects, that's okay, but you have to have a long breath. Uh, if you are interested a little bit more in the background or what other people think about me, then you can read that in the last I issue they made a, a small uh, interview with me. Um, so, yeah, this is basically the, to give you an idea. <laughs> Thank you.